15 minutes uh, to raise and answer questions. Um, I'm going to uh, suggest that you come on both sides there where the microphones are, and then you can ask your questions that way. Please ask a question, identify yourself, do not make a speech, because that's unfair to everybody else. And let's start on the left side here. Hi, my name is Ben, and um, I just graduated from college. I'd like to ask the panel if they could assess the media's coverage of the stimulus bill. Because while it seems to be, you know, what you know, they hope to be the end all of this crisis, a lot of Americans don't seem to understand what exactly is in this 700-page-plus bill. Well, Americans, are, you know, let, let's, we should deal with a, uh, with a couple of things about journalism. And, and I didn't, didn't uh, challenge Marvin on this earlier. But the idea, there's a model that some people have in their heads that there's bad things in the world, and if journalists would just uncover them, or if they would just shine the light on it, then everyone would see what the reality is, and it would work out well. Bob Woodward started that. Right. Sometimes that happens, but most of the time it doesn't. It's, we have a role to play, but we don't control this process. And there's a lot of people involved in it. And um, the coverage of this has been pretty good. Has it been great? No. But th the public is not going to come to a conclusion about a 700-page bill. And to give them more information about a 700-page bill is not what they want. They, 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 that's not their job, is to have an opinion, a detailed opinion about a 700-page bill. That's not the way a representative democracy works. Um, but it is being presented, hang on Steve, yeah. it is being presented as an argument between those who feel that you ought to cut taxes even more, those who feel that there ought to be greater government intervention. You do have a conflict between the two uh, points of view, and that is being argued almost every day well, that is on radio argued. and television. And that is being covered. But that um, is no, no, I'm not, I'm not saying it's not it's covered. A, it's an idiotic argument, but anyway, that is being Why covered. Why is it an idiotic argument? Well, well, for a lot of reasons. It's, I mean, you know, when you get to arguments like, well, this isn't a st stimulus bill, it's a spending bill, that's economic nonsense. That's what stimulus is, as the president points out in his speech to the Democratic uh, uh, caucus the other night. I mean, there is some idiocy about this. And we, we should try to present the issues as they should be. That's not to say we shouldn't tell people, well, this is a good bill, bad bill, but here are the trade-offs. If you spend this much money, here's, here's, the, you know, here's what it might do, here's what it might not do. So we do have that role, and we have, I think, done a pretty good job of fulfilling that role. But the idea that somehow we're all going to come to some great consensus about a 700 page bill, or that there is a perfect bill, that if we only shined enough light on it, we'd all come to that, th these, are, these are somewhat political science fantasies. Um, and we should, you know, this is a messy business politics. Next question, please. My name is Eric. I'm from Washington, D.C. I have a sort of follow-up to the, well, we reported about the, fa the fact that foreclosures were up. And I'm going to sort of test the ask that, that question. What was up? Uh, that foreclosures were up and we, re we reported that. My, my problem with that is that the, the, the thing that wasn't explained was you've got foreclosures are up and you've got mortgage-backed securities and collateral collateralized debt obligations and companies own those. And when those defaults start, start coming, the ABS is the CDOs. You got a question here. Yeah, the, the question is, do you think do you think you tied that together enough in in, in hindsight and explain why that would end up freezing credit markets? No. Well, no, if I if I you know what if I'm their weather guy and I tell you it's minus ten outside, it's up to you to put the long johns on the coat on. But also, the, the, you've got the time you've got the timing a little bit off too. Yeah. The, the the problems with subprime mortgages preceded the development of mortgage-backed securities that included subprime mortgages. For many, many years, mortgage-backed securities, as Alexis knows, did not include subprime debt. You had, you had to be a AAA mortgage to get in, in mortgage-backed securities. So for a long, long time, uh, there was, there, mortgage-backed securities were not containing the seeds of their own destruction by these high default rates. It was only in the past few years that subprime mortgages began to be packaged into uh, uh, securities that somehow were rated triple A. 
Now, that was an extremely complex process that, yes, I think we did endeavor to cover, to follow how that was happening. Uh, but the, there is inherent in that question the notion that there is one, um, there's one thing here. There's one subprime mortgage mess and there's one mortgage-backed securities mess. It was far more complicated and that, and that, that. The, and that every connection came from everything that happened. I mean, it, it, there were times when the only news that was reportable and relevant was that there was an increase in subprime mortgages, in, in mortgage defaults. One didn't, it, it, in hindsight, you can look back at it and say, wow, if we had all that information that we had at the time, then my reporting a year ago would have been this is going to happen, and then, and by the way, Lehman Brothers is going to have some trouble. Bear Stearns not going to be a company anymore. We, we, that's not the line you draw as you're going through the reporting on every day. We didn't, not all of these things had the same information uh, attached Next question, to them. please. Hello, my name is Rob Kimmer. I'm a GW Law alumnus, practicing attorney, and legal journalist. Uh, my question to the panel comes off of a post article I read uh, talking about the executive compensation limitations. You touched on it earlier. Um, my question is, uh, it, it, the article explained very well that the limitation would not affect that many executives. Is, my question to the panel is, is the limitation on executives pay just a show, or do you think it's really going to have an effect on how business is conducted? Well, Thank let you. me ask you a question. If, if I told you that it affected 25 top officers of a corporation, would you consider that a lot or a little? Of a large corporation? Yeah. I think that's sizable. If it affects if it, between yeah. 25 and 50 top executives, sure. It affects the top 25 executives of a corporation. But there, there may be traders in companies that make several millions of dollars a year because they earn several billions of dollars a year for the company. You comfortable with that or not? Um, I, I guess what, what I read in the article was that a lot of companies. No, no are just I asked you a question. No, I don't ask you what you read, I, I asked you whether you're comfortable. <laughs> Are you comfortable with that? Someone's going to, someone in a company that lost money last year but earned billions of dollars for the company is going to earn a $10 million bonus. Are you happy with that or not? No, I'm not. That's, that's what okay. I'm not well, happy with. Yeah. That's why you're not running the company. <laughs> Alexis, do you want to add something? Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I spent the vast majority of my career on Wall Street, so I, I know how those compensation structures work. And look, I think what we're hearing right now is a populist message because people are angry and they're frustrated and they want results and they're angry about some specific people who took advantage of the system or who took these outrageous bonuses but it's a very very difficult way to judge everybody within an infrastructure some of which those people make tens and hundreds of millions of dollars for these corporations so I mean I, I asked Jamie Dimon this question a couple days ago I said listen are the actions of a few you tainting the work of the many. And he said it's no different than a, one reporter is different than another reporter. One doctor is different than a different. You can't lump them all together. And so I think what we're seeing is the actions of a few are being lumped into the entire framework of Wall Street that all these guys are bad guys. They're not all bad guys. Yes, please. My name is Yosef. I'm a student at George Washington University. Uh, my question is, uh, how do you think the business of business reporting will change uh, going forward once we recover from this economic crisis, hopefully in the not so distant future? Well, business reporting uh, has been one of the growth areas of journalism for the past decade and a half. Uh, that, was, that was the good news. Um, if you were coming out of journalism school any time over the past 20 years, you could probably find a job in business journalism. It, it was expanding. There were all sorts of uh, uh, business to business publications, trade journals who were hiring. Uh, and so it was, it was a growth industry. It's probably going to retrench, but I still think it's going to remain a pretty strong and stable part of journalism at large. It's going to change, though, in terms of the kinds of expertise that I think it's going to, uh, going to require. The internet is a fragmenting technology. It breaks us all up into little bitty pieces of expertise. And the, the, niche, the niche players are going to the people who, who go deep, not wide. They're going to know a great deal about something, but not a lot about uh, a broader world. So I think that's how it's going to change. Yes, please. My name is Landon Manjikian. I'm a senior at the George Washington University and an English major. One of the themes tonight has been the misuse of credit, both at the individual and company level. 
So my question is, why is it that, and what example does it set that the government is borrowing more money than ever before? Ellie? Well, well we're, yeah, the, the credit issue uh, is one for individuals, it's one for uh, the companies that employ us, and it's one for the government. Uh, it, it's a terrible example. Um, if, there is a, if there is a bigger Ponzi scheme than Bernard Madoff, it's Social Security. Uh, so, except that, that, that it's transparent. We all know it's happening. We, we can't say that we were duped by it. Uh, this is a very, very serious problem, and unfortunately, because the, the financial crisis set in during the last election, we didn't get a chance to have the, the great national debate we should have about getting ourselves out of long-term debt as a country. But this discussion now needs to be had as individuals uh, with our employers who are also too heavily indebted and as a country. This is a, this is a problem we all have. It's a good question, and it's something we need to tackle. Go ahead, Steve. It is ironic, and it is counterintuitive that in order to get out of a problem caused by us taking on too much debt, you gotta spend more. the federal government has to take on more. The simple explanation for that irony is the following. At a time when the rest of the economy, which means households and businesses, are deleveraging, which they need to do, in order to prevent that process from spinning out of control and bringing us into a, into a very bad cycle in which we overshoot on the way down, the government has to try to stabilize things. And it turns out that at this period of time, it's only the United States government that can A, borrow money, and as it turns out, borrow it very cheaply. And so at this moment in time, it's good for the government to keep doing a little more of that while the rest of us do less of it so that we create a good balance for household and business finances, and then the government can do its part in the next phase as it winds down. But if we all did it at the same time, you wouldn't like the way it felt. <laughs> Go ahead. My name is David Earle, a resident of Washington, D.C., and an alumnus of the George Washington University. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the bottom line for news organizations and the way they cover business. Uh, I have a hard time believing that it's a, a No, I'd like to question you. We don't have much time. Okay. Uh, I just, what does it mean for one organization to say the sky is falling while the other organizations are saying that the economic indicators are good? Is it dangerous to be that one person offering the bad news? Don't people want to hear good news? And do executives have an influence on how that's covered? They don't have an influence on how it's covered, at least in newspapers. Um, I don't know about television. It's probably a Alexis, little... why don't you try that? Well, listen, I mean, to be perfectly honest with you, I do have a theory that there are a lot of Wall Street firms out there whose economists have been predicting a second half of the year recovery and I believe they're predicting a second half of the year recovery because it's good for them. I mean, let's be perfectly honest, it's self-serving. I mean, I, I go crazy when people tell me, oh, second half of the year recovery, no big deal. I, I think the bottom line is for a news organization in our position, we've got to call them out. You know, when you have an X amount of economists who appear on who you do think are serving in the best interest of their corporation. I mean, I can't tell you how many CEOs in Davos said, oh, we've completely written off 2009. Well, I knew they were using me to be the conduit to tell that message out there so that when they do provide those upside surprises in the mm -hmm. third or fourth quarter, they look like geniuses and rock stars. So you have to be very, very careful what they want you to say, and you have to weigh it and ask those tough questions. We got only time. We have time for only one more question, please. Uh, thank you all for coming this evening. First off, as a young American, uh, the bailout package earlier in the year, ask $300 question. billion. Dollars. Okay. My question is this, what are the key components that this current bailout package that they're talking about, or spending bill that Congress is talking about, what are the key components that this bill must have for us to look to the future with some confidence? Okay. Well, it's three things it's got to have. One is, is uh, well, three things that people on Capitol Hill think it has to have. Uh, there is a contingent that, that thinks it has to have adequate cu uh, cuts in taxes that will allow people to have some money and business to have some money to invest it and create jobs. Number two, uh, there are others who think that it needs to effectively spend money in a way that creates jobs for people in a more direct fashion, like infrastructure spending or changing over hospital records, <laughs> things that'll create jobs uh, and so create some lasting effect. And number three, we've had a lot of people who have been put out of their homes or jobs
jobs in this country, and there's an element of this will be that will enhance uh, a social safety net uh, like food stamps, uh, COBRA, the ability to buy health care, unemployment insurance, social security emergency benefits. So those are the three categories that uh, these things typically fall into, and there's endless debate as to which one or, or which of them are more important and what in what uh, proportions you should do these things, but that uh, debate goes back all through history. But that's ultimately what the debate is, whether you cut taxes, let people make decisions on their own about how they spend their money, or whether you direct that money in a way that might be overall, uh, of overall benefit to the economy. That, that debate isn't going to end this year or next year or for many years to come. That sounds like the end of a program. <laughs> um, so let me just say to all of you again, thank you very much. But particularly thanks to our panel, it's absolutely wonderful. Thank you so very much. Appreciate it.